So today we will have a quick review of the fundamental control flow that C++ computing offers us and in the process we will look at couple of more examples on computing. One involving the finding out of roots, another method we'll look at. The purpose of that looking at that method is that called bisection method. We shall use this subsequently to introduce an extremely important notion of searching given data in very large arrays. So we will do the review of the control flow. As you know control flow ordinarily in any program is that our Dumbo or C++ will execute our instructions sequentially one after another. But whenever we want instructions to be executed out of sequence based on certain conditions, we have special instructions which are through the if statement fundamentally where you conditionally execute one block or the other which is simple and understood very easily by everyone. But there is another mechanism of setting up an iteration which permits us to repeatedly execute a block of instructions again and again and again. And that is what makes C++ or any other programming language so powerful. It is absolutely important that each one of us understands exactly what happens when such iterations are executed. We have seen the while and for loops. We shall re-examine them looking at a variant of while in the process. Finally, we will look at the array manipulations. We had looked at an array last time, how exactly the large arrays could be read in and how exactly we could find maximum element of a given array, etc. But today we shall introduce a search problem. Again, the emphasis is on using the control structures both for ordinary computation without involving arrays but involving only simple variables and also using array variants. First we look at the iteration using while loop. So suppose there are there is a long program that you have written. The first comment says there is a previous line. Before that there might be some other lines of program. The next one says while condition opening glass code block closing glass. So this essentially is the while loop starting here ending here and this will be followed by next instruction. So ordinarily C++ will be executing all instructions before this, then this and ordinarily it will just execute all of this once and go ahead. But because of while statement an iteration is introduced. What does the while statement do really? This is the control flow in the while loop. I had drawn this kind of flow chart by hand but it is absolutely essential that each one of you understands perfectly how exactly instructions are executed so I am very quickly refreshing our memory. Suppose there is a sub program instructions here they will be executed indicated by the previous line which is executed here. Incidentally this kind of flow chart had been the standard way of depicting steps in our algorithm in a traditional sense. Nowadays people do not have to draw flow chart because they can understand the program constructs in an abstract sense much more easily. But for beginners it is useful to look at such flow charts. We had explained this notion that a box will contain any one of the statements like assignment or input or output or whatever that is an action. A diamond will introduce a condition which will be checked and a diamond in a flow chart will have exactly two outlets. One called the true outlet, another called the false outlet. So if the condition is true, the program flow sequence goes this way. If it is false, the program flow sequence goes this way. So effectively when you say while condition code block, what it means is that this condition is evaluated. If the condition is true, then the code block is executed and the C++ Dumbo jumps back to recheck that condition. So this is the loop, this is the while loop and this while loop will be executed as long as the condition remains true. The moment condition becomes false, you will get out of this loop and go to the next line which may be the next line of instruction. This is simple but it is important that you understand the exact significance of how it is done. Very important to note the condition is evaluated at the beginning before you enter the loop and the code block is then executed only if the condition is true. If it is true the code block is executed and then you go back to evaluate the condition. So that is the iteration part. 
Is this very clear? Because this simple three line instruction actually may cause the computer to execute 1 million or 10 million times the code block depending upon the condition that you have written, which is the crux of the power of computing that we get and the power of expression that we get to make C++ work harder. Here is another example from our computational routines. This is finding out a root by what we call the bisection method. You are by now familiar with the roots of an equation. So let us say this is a function fx which has something like this shape. So this is x axis, this is y axis. We do not know where the 0 of x equal to 0 is, it does not matter. What we need to find out is at which point this function crosses x axis because that is where f of x is 0 at some point in x. So this is the desired root as is shown here. We had done earlier a different set of argument to locate this root by finding out the uh, root through newton raphson method. But there is another simpler iteration method that is possible. This method will work only if we know at least one value on either side of the root which is one is positive, one is negative. What is the meaning? Consider this value which I have arbitrarily called high, h i and consider this value which I have arbitrarily called low, l o. Notice that at the point x equal to h i, f x i is positive. At the point x equal to l o, f x i is negative. Very clearly, if at one point the value is positive, one point the value is negative, then f x equal to 0 must lie somewhere in between. We do not know where it lies. In this example diagram, we have shown that the root lies here. But since we do not know, one simple method is we get the midpoint of this high and low, cal calculate actually high plus low by 2. This is the midpoint. Does this midpoint have any sanctity? No. It is an arbitrary guess. We divide high plus low by 2, we get some midpoint. At midpoint, we evaluate the function again. So what happens now? In this particular example, we see that the function is still positive. What it means? If the function is positive here, then the root must now lie between this point and the low point. Is that obvious? So what have we done effectively? We have reduced the search space. Originally this whole thing was the search space. From low to high we were searching for the root. We have reduced that space by half because we have gone to the midpoint. Suppose this function was negative at this point, what would I have done? We would have said the root lies on the right hand side. So by finding out the midpoint and evaluating the function at the midpoint, we suddenly know whether the root lies on the right of midpoint or left of midpoint. In this example case, the root lies on midpoint, uh, left of midpoint. So what we should do now? We should reset h i to this point. So if we reset h i to mid and re-execute the same block of code, we will again find another midpoint somewhere here. Obviously, we will go closer to it may so happen that in this process at some point the midpoint may come on this side. If it comes on this side, obviously the function value will be negative there and we know that the root must lie on the right of that. At which point we will set low to the new midpoint rather than high. Is that clear? So if this is how I wish to actually execute this algorithm, I need initially a mechanism of course to calculate f of x, so there must be some formula giving f of x. I do not need derivative or anything, I just need f of x. But I also need a good guess for the high value and a good guess for the low value. We can, given any complex equation, we can arbitrarily evaluate it for x, so guessing is not very difficult. But the program must check whether your guess is right or wrong. How can a program check whether your initial guess is right or wrong? Well, we know that at one point the value must be positive, at another point the value must be negative. We do not know which one. High need not mean that the value of the function is high. High means it is on the higher side of x, low means it is on the lower side of x. But one thing is very clear, one of the function values should be positive, one should be negative. Clearly, their product must be positive. 
their product must be negative. If the product is positive, either both function values are positive or both function values are negative, so there is no root, unlikely, okay. So we start with high and low values such that function value of low multiplied by function value at high is less than 0, which is negative. You can see this condition means something. If this condition is true, then your initial guess is correct. Starting with this initial guess now, you compute midpoint and the function value at midpoint. Now you just need to compare if the modulus of that function value is greater than 0. If the function value becomes 0, you have found the root. But the function value may be positive or negative, slightly more than 0, slightly less than 0. So you have to consider the absolute value of that function at the midpoint the absolute value which is known by mod. So absolute value of f of mid should be greater than 0. Now the trouble is exact 0 is very difficult to achieve. Look at this particular point. You notice at this point the function f of x is 0 exactly. But notice that computationally since you are calculating midpoint iteratively, you may approach that point from this side or that side and there might be a f of x which is minus 0 0.0001 or plus 0 0.001 or 0 0.002. So reaching 0 is a matter of chance. We do not need the root with that much exact accuracy because we cannot find it with that much exact accuracy. This is a computational method, not algebraic solution. So exact root finding is impossible. So we define some kind of a threshold value, some small threshold value or some small tolerance saying that if at the final midpoint, the value of the function, absolute value of the function is less than 0 0.001, let us say, then we assume that it is the root. So we stop our iterations at that point and that is why we check if the value of the function at midpoint is greater than that threshold value, we look at the next interval. The next interval as I said would be either low comma mid or mid comma high. It will be either this interval or this interval. Is that clear? The program then gets written like this. We write this program to solve a cubics, ax cube plus bx square plus cx plus d. We take in as inputs a, b, c, d. We also take in as input low, high and tall. Tall is short for tolerance. So tolerance is that small error which we are willing to live with. Now this particular program should return immediately if function of low and function of high multiplication is greater than 0 as we discussed initially. This means our initial value guess itself is wrong. I cannot find the roots. But if the value guess are okay, then as long as function value at the midpoint is greater than my tolerance, I will keep repeating what? I will keep repeating finding out the next interval which will be set to either low mid or mid high and keep repeating this. Whenever I find the midpoint which is very close to f of mid equal to 0, that is within my tolerance, I will get out. And so I will return the midpoint which is the root if and when f mid becomes less than tolerance. Is this clear? The program then writes like this. So notice it says include IO stream using namespace std statements which we make without really understanding them. But int men we all understand, that is the main program. We de define float a, b, c, d, low, high, mid, f, l, o, f, h, i, f, mid. What would these be representing? f, l, o means function value at low point, f, h, i means function value at high point and f, mid is the function value at mid point. This is a notation, any name I could have used. I define another variable called tall which is short for tolerance. In actual program when you write, you should by the way write tolerance, midpoint, you should write variable names which make immediate sense to the reader. The only reason why I am not doing it here in the class is I have a limited space on the slide. Otherwise the ENC of tolerance may go outside the screen. So I am using these short names but that is not indicated practice. So, I first ask for ABCD values, 
and then I collect ABCD values. Then I ask for low, high and tolerance values, the three input values and I collect LO, HI and TOL values from input. This is the initial setting. So I got ABCD as the coefficients of the quadratic and I got the values of low and mid, uh, high which are initial guesses followed by the tolerance. Initially itself what do I have to do? Remember I have got low and high but I have to first check whether function at low and function at high are at the opposite side of the x-axis otherwise I can't find a root. So I evaluate FLO as A into low into low into low plus B into low into low plus C into low plus D. This is a crazy way of calculating cube root and square root but this is the easiest way for C++. Then we calculate FHI again similarly this time we use high instead of low. So we got FHI and FLO initially. Now we check if FLO into FHI is greater than 0 then what it means either both are positive or both are negative. So I get out. I say error in high low backslash n return 1. Notice that ordinarily in the main program whenever we write return we have encountered return 0 so far and we have said we routinely write it. This time we say return 1. This is actually a neat technique used by programmers to return to the operating system Dumbo because main program will return to the operating system telling the operating system that look some ghapla happened during execution of this program. I have not executed the program properly is easiest way to indicate is to give a non-zero value. Actually later on when we write very large programming systems we can use such values it could be 1, it could be 110, it could be 270, any number of values that you can think of. But the returning operating system or a program to which, another program to which this function returns can make use of this value to take intelligent action. If the value is 1, it means I did not give high and low correctly. If the value is 2, it may mean something else, etc., etc. We shall discuss these things later. But I, this is just to, for you to understand that if high and low are not proper in the context of my bisection method then I am quitting the program. The program execution will not go further. Please note that ordinarily we have said that if I execute an if statement here, this is an if statement then if this condition is true only these statements will be executed otherwise subsequent statements will be executed. Even if this condition is true, these statements will be executed and then next statements will be executed. That is our understanding of if. But if within inside any code block, if there is a return statement, it supersedes anything else that program says. The return statement says, forget everything, get out, go back. So this is like break. Just get out of this whole mess and go back to the operating system, don't execute anything further. Return is therefore an extremely powerful statement. That is the reason why you would usually have the return statement only at the end of the program, never anywhere in between. But this is a special case, I can't proceed any further and therefore I need to return. So that is how I do it. Well, how else I could have done that instead of returning here? I could have put the brass and put an else and written the entire program under that else block. This is a simpler way of doing it. Now, this is where I will write the main program. So the main part of our code will come here. What is that main part? You know that bisection method, finding out the midpoint, iterating, etc., etc. Obviously at the end of this I would have found out the root. And what would be the root? The midpoint, the last midpoint used. And that is what is being put out here. If we come ever to this point, then we return with zero, telling the operating system Dumbo that everything is all right. So is the main line of code clear? First I read the values of A, B, C, D, then I calculate function value at low, function value at high, then I check whether the function values have opposite side so that there is a possibility of my finding a root in between. If it is not so, I print an error message on my terminal and get out. Return 1 means get out shouting bad things, 1, 1, 1, not 0. Otherwise I come out here, I will write the main part of my code here and then I will print the value of mid. 
What is the main part of the code? That is shown on the next slide. So look at this slide carefully because this shows the main program using which we iteratively go to the root. The first one, initial values for mid and F mid. Starting with low and high, I calculate the midpoint. Very simple, mid is equal to low plus high by 2. Having got the midpoint, I will now calculate the function value at the midpoint, which I have represented by a variable name F mid. So I said F mid is equal to same thing, A into mid into mid plus B into mid into mid plus C into mid plus D. This will give me the cubic function value at that point. After that, while F ABS in bracket F mid greater than tall, what does this statement do? This while statement, I am setting up an iteration. But what does that condition say? Remember, the condition that we wanted was to check the absolute value of the function value at that midpoint. The function value at midpoint we have calculated and we have called it F mid. This F mid, therefore, is a variable name. However, this F ABS is not our variable name. This F ABS is the name of a standard function, a standard computational function which comes ready made with C++. Can you guess what does F ABS do? Calculates the absolute value. Very simply, if F mid was positive, that will be the absolute value. If it was negative, the negative of that will be the absolute value. We could have written a complicated statement also here, but this is much simpler. Again, tells you the importance of having such ready-made functions available as assistance to us. F apps is one such function. So when I say F apps, F mid, greater than tolerance. Remember, we don't say greater than zero because we may never reach zero. That is why we took the tolerance value. If that is so, then what am I supposed to do? I am now supposed to decide whether the new range where I search is between low and mid or is between mid and high. So very clearly, that will depend upon what? Whether again I will check F low into F mid is greater than 0. If F low into F mid is greater than 0, what does it mean? That both low and mid are such that function value is either on the positive side or on the negative side, on same side. So that means the F mid is still taking me or keeping me on the same side as F low. If that is so, then I must advance F low to F mid, uh, uh, low to mid. So that is what is being done. I reset low to mid and F low to F mid because I have found that value already. If that is not so, if the signs are opposite, that means now midpoint has crossed over from the low side. So obviously the range I have to search for is between mid and high. So this time I will set high to the midpoint and FHI to F mid. I'm sorry, the other way around. Please execute these statements in your lab or by hand yourself to convince yourself that the algorithm actually works correctly. But this is a simple mechanism. All that I'm doing is I have a range, doesn't really matter but let's stick to the nomenclature that we have used. So this is low and this is F of low. This is high and this is F of high and let's say this is my midpoint. So if this is mid and this is F of mid, So when I compare the value of the function at low and the value of the function at mid, I know they are of opposite size, which means the root must lie between these two points. So that means in this given situation, I must now search for this range of value. Please note, originally I was searching between low and high. Now I have to search between low and mid. So what should happen? High should become mid. And the function value of high should become function value at mid. And then the new search begins exactly using the same logic. This is what has been done here. If FLO multiplied by F mid is not greater than 0, 
that means the condition that we saw, saw in the example, then I have set hi to mid and FHI to mid. On the other hand, if mid pi is on the, this side, I have to shift low, which is what is done here. So is this clear how it is done? Very simple then, I calculate the new midpoint and I calculate the new F mid because now there is a new midpoint and with this my while statement ends. So I will go back again and again check the absolute value of F mid. This simple uh, code will cause the computer to reiterate around this body till it finds out the route to a desired accuracy. You can change the value of tolerance and see what happens but that is the main part of the code. So please note that the while statement is an extremely effective control structure which permits us to set up an iteration during which any given code is executed again and again and again while a condition remains true. And you must remember what happens, first the condition is checked, only if it is true you enter the code block and then keep on repeating that the condition is correct. There is another way of iteration however which is called a do while loop. Very similar to our while iteration, this we have not seen, so this is a new thing. In this do while loop, we first write the word do, then put an opening glass, then write the block of code which is to be iterated and finally at the end of that block, we say while condition. In plain English it means do this while this condition is true. The difference is there is no condition checking at the beginning. Do this is the first statement. So in this kind of control structure, C++ will execute that block first time automatically without checking anything. Then it will check the condition. If the condition is true, it will go back and do this again and again and again. When the condition becomes false, it will fall down and go to the next step. A slight variation therefore as compared to the other uh, uh, while that we had seen. So this is the flow chart for that. Unlike in the previous while execution, I come from the previous slide and I automatically execute the code block once. Having executed, I check the condition. Is the condition true? I go back again and execute the code block. If it is still true, I go back again and so on. But the moment condition becomes false, I come out and I go to the next one. I think it is very simple and straightforward. So it is clear. Try to rewrite the previous program using do while. Just so you understand how the condition checking has to be done differently, how initialization has to be done differently, etc., etc. The third way of setting up iterations is through counting. Oh, this is just a confirmation of what we just said. These are the features of do while loop. I have written uh, the thing again. After previous line I said do code block while condition and the two important things, code block is executed at least once no matter what the condition and the condition is evaluated only at the end. If that condition is true, you go back to again execute code block. This is the variation. So this is the for loop. Can anybody tell me what it does? Well, I have a comment there which says count down. So what does countdown do? It starts with int main, it introduces an integer variable called count. For count equal to 10, count greater than 0, count equal to count minus 1, do the following. What? See out, that is print out the value of count followed by a comma and keep on doing this. At the end it says, end of line value of count is count. So I am printing count many, many times. What will this for loop do? It will start with count equal to 10, execute this once, then will reduce count by 1 because uh, instruction at the end is say count minus 1. So count will become 9, then it will become 8, etc., etc. Until the condition is valid, it will keep executing it, but at the end it will come out of the iteration and just to mark the end of iteration, we have put a output statement there. So here is a quiz. When we execute these code lines, the value of the count printed, last one, B, okay. 
Anybody A? Nobody A. So it can't be 11 because I am counting down. Common sense. B, how many will say B? Several people will say B because B is 1. What was the reason? Well, anybody for C? Ah, large number of people for C. Anybody for D? Nobody for D. Nobody thinks it will be minus 1. Okay. A and D are obviously not correct answers and I am glad everybody got it. The confusion is between B and C. Let us look at when you will come out of the loop. Please note the condition here says if count is greater than 0 then keep doing this. That is how in first place you got here when count was 10. So when count was 9 you will come down. Count was 8 you will come down. If the final value printed by this statement was to be 1 and 1 is greater than 0, there is no way you could have come out of the loop. If the last value of count was 1, then that value is greater than 0. So you would have necessarily entered the loop for the last time. When you execute this for the last time and you try to go back again, that is when count is decremented. Now count becomes 0. And when count becomes 0, since 0 is not greater than 0, the for loop is terminated. So when you come out and use this line to print out, the value printed will be 0. So C is the right answer. Please note that now after having heard this explanation, things seem so simple. But there were several of us who did not realize it instantly. You must realize it instantly and therefore must understand perfectly the flow of control that happens on a for loop. So let us revisit the control flow in the for loop. It has four parts. The first part is initial expression. The second part is condition. And the third part is end expression. All the three are contained in, as a specification in the for statement. The fourth part is the body itself, which is to be executed again and again and again. It is very important to understand the sequence in which these four parts are executed. Very, very important. There are three parts all written in the same line as for, but not all of them are executed at one straight. And that is the crux of the for loop. So let us look at the flow chart for this. So notice there is a previous line from which you come to the for statement. When you come inside the for statement, the first thing that you do is execute the initial expression. What is the initial expression? What was the initial expression in our program? Count equal to 10. So count is set to 10 here. After this, you execute the condition evaluation. What was the condition? Is count greater than 0? If the count is greater than 0, condition will evaluate to true and then and only then you will get inside where you will execute the code block. If it is not true, then and only then you will come out of the entire for loop and go to the next line. If you come inside the code block because the condition is true, then you do not execute the third statement which is the increment or decrement. You first execute the code block. The iteration block is first executed. So this is the crux of the problem. The for statement says initialization, condition, and end of the loop expression. But all the three are not executed in sequence. The initialization is executed, then the condition is checked, after which if the condition is true, code block is executed. And only after the code block is executed, you then ex execute the end expression. What was the end expression in our case this time? Count equal to count minus 1. So count gets decremented only after executing the code block. But before quitting, so only after end expression is executed, you actually go back and check the condition for the next loop and keep repeating this. So now it is clear why that if the condition says count greater than 0, when count is 1, actually 1 is greater than 0, so you will enter here, execute that code block. Now you will say end expression, count equal to count minus 1, count will now become 0. Now when you go back, condition count greater than 0 is not satisfied because 0 is not greater than 0 and therefore you will come out. 
and when you come out and in the next line you try to print the value of count, it will be one less than what with what value the last loop was executed. It is one less because the decrement is count equal to count minus one. It could be if we had said count equal to count minus 23, it would be 23 less, whatever. The last value with which the loop was not executed will be the value that you will come out with. Is this very clear? Everybody clear on this? Fine. So we now go to our favorite array elements. This was the program to find out the maximum of n numbers. We just read n numbers from our input. Int a 100 max n i c in n for i equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus. This is the for loop. I read the value of n numbers and I put them in an array. So I read a0, a1, a2, a3. To find out maximum, I start with a0. For i equal to 1, i less than n, i plus plus. If ai is equal to max, I say max is equal to ai. And this simple iteration will permit me to examine each and every element sequentially. At the end, whatever is the value of max, that is the largest value in that array. It doesn't matter whether the array has 7 elements or 7,000 elements or 7 million elements. The program will work fine. Is that clear? You can see how the for loops are a must for handling arrays. Because array elements have to be typically examined from 0 to n or something like that. And typically we have to examine them in sequence. So this kind of for iteration, for i equal to 0 to n, for i equal to 5 to something, whatever, whatever, is going to be most common while examining array elements. And that is the reason why this loop is written like this. Suppose I wanted to find out who is the student who has maximum marks. How will I do that? Assume that only one student has maximum marks. That is the assumption. So how do we find out the roll number of the student who has maximum marks? Same program, how will I modify? I of course cannot use A100 and so on, but I can use the array that I had seen last time. You remember this? I just listed this array. This in fact will be there in your lab sheets when you go there as a separate file text file. You will also have the program which we wrote last time so that you can execute it to read those, that entire file into two arrays. One array will be called role, another array will be called marks. Imagine now we are finding out the maximum of marks here. So what will I do? I will set up initially max is equal to Right? That's the first task. So that means max will be value 72. Now I will have my for loop which will say for I am using a different terminology where NSTD stands for number of students. The actual variable used was different. So what I want to do, I want to keep examining every student marks, keep comparing it against whatever max I have arbitrarily chosen and if that is different, I want to reset it. So what will be the instruction here? If I am sorry, this should be square brackets and not normal brackets. If max i is greater than max, what should I do? I should set max is that correct? Now any time I reset max, I know the position at that point in time. 
So, for example, when I get the first number 72, I set it here. I then examine for i equal to 1. Please know that the value of i is 0, 1, 2, etc. Because the arrays in C++ start with 0. So, that is why I have set mark maximum to mark 0 first. In the first iteration, marks 1 will be compared with mark. So, marks 1 is 45. Is 45 greater than 72? No. So, nothing will happen. I will carry on. This is the end of my for loop. However, when I come to the next student, 1003 has 91 marks. 91 is greater than max. So, max will now become 91. But I do I not know at this stage that this maximum corresponds to the second roll number, whatever it is. It is therefore prudent to say position equal to Is that correct? So, I not only mark the maximum, I mark the position where the maximum has occurred. I now carry on with this iteration. I go to i equal to 3. Is 86 greater than 91? No. I will not do anything in fact if you look at these sample marks. But had there been somebody with 94 marks, then I would have reset maximum to mark. When I come out of this for iteration, you will agree that max actually has the maximum marks. but Roll i contains the roll number of the maximum marks. Do you agree with that? No? How can you agree with that? If I say this, what is the value of i when I come out here? I will be actually one more than number of students. So I will be here. And what is value here? Abraka, abraka. You want to print this funny roll number? Remember, we have marked the position. Position is therefore the index into this array. What was the position in this case? If maximum was 91, the position would have been 2 because that was the value of i at that point and that we have captured in position. So correspondingly, I must not write this, but I must write what? Role indexed by position. Is this understood? Position was the index inside the array where the roll number securing maximum mark says because that was the time when I had located 91 as max and therefore that time whatever was the value of i that is the position of this two. Doesn't matter where I go further. If I remember max I will remember the position. If subsequently someone scores 98 then I will change max but I will also reset position to whatever value of i was at that point in time. Remember, i is a root variable. I have no business outputting i for any reason whatsoever after this because the value of i is controlled and used for controlling the loop. It is not of significance. What is of significance is some position, some value of i which was relevant while traversing the loop. And that value I have to capture separately and use that separately. So now if I say, C out, roll position and max. Can I write instead of max, can I write marks position? Yes or no? So he has correctly pointed out the equal to symbol should not be there, only less than. Because the last element of the array to be examined, suppose there are seven students, the last element will not be positioned as seventh element, but as sixth element. So the last element I examine must be one less than number of students. Sorry for the mistake, very good for you to point this out. So is this clear now, how the, how the uh, uh, loop will run? This is how you need to execute it. Suppose I want you to find a given roll number and his or her marks in this array. How will you do that? This is the array which I had given. The sample array might look very small, but in general, the data that we handle for students could be very large. For this class itself, there will be 850 entries into this. For students, 
appearing for higher secondary examination of a state, let's say Maharashtra state. How many students will be there? About maybe 4, 5, 10 lakh students. When you have such large numbers, how do you search for marks for a given student? One simple way is just like we found max. You read a given roll number first and start examining the entire array from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Is the given roll number equal to this roll number? If it is, then you have found it, print the corresponding marks, right? This is called the linear search and I have a program which shows you that. It's called findmarks.cpp. So given a roll number, find the marks. I define roll number array, marks array, number of students, n students. Int given role, found marks, position i. N students is get data, roll comma marks. That is the function that we wrote last time without bothering how exactly it does thing. But it will read from the file and stuff my two arrays with roll numbers and marks. I need to appreciate only that at this juncture. That means from this point onwards, I have number of students given by n students. I have those many roll numbers and those many marks. Now I am saying, I read the given roll. Somebody gives me a roll number, 1008. So I want to examine each element of the roll number array. Whichever contains 1008, I should print the corresponding marks. So what am I doing inside this for iteration? I am just checking if roll number i is equal to given roll. If it is, I say found marks is equal to marks i. If it is not, I go back to the next iteration, increase i by 1 and look at the next number, look at the next number, look at the next number. When I come out, whatever is the value of found marks will be the marks for the given roll and I output. I will leave you with just two questions which I want you to think about. We'll answer these tomorrow and you'll also look at these in the lab. First question, what happens if the roll number does not exist? After all, roll numbers need not be sequential or somebody might have forgotten to insert the roll number or a roll number I give may not exist. For example, if you have seen that list, 1005 does not exist there. And suppose I give as input 1005, please give me the marks. What will this program produce? It will take given role as 1005 and it will examine the entire array. It will not find 1005. So what will it do? Whatever is the junk value in found marks because I have initialized it at all. So what will that drawer labeled found marks will contain? We don't know. If it contains 100, what will it mean? Roll number 1500 marks without appearing for exam. It should not happen, right? Therefore, if I do not find that fellow at all, I must have an if statement afterwards. How do I have an if statement? I assume that all marks are positive or zero at the most. But nobody can score, let us say, minus 20,000 marks. 20,000 is arbitrary number. What I will do then is I will set found marks to minus 20,000 to begin with. Now I will go through the array search. If I find actual legitimate marks of some student, found marks will change. But if at the end of iteration, if found marks is still minus 20,000, I will say sorry, given role does not exist. Do you agree that that is the prudent programming? That is the one question. I have told you the answer. The second question is tougher. If instead of seven students in the array, if I have seven million students, how much Godagiri are we making C++ Dumbo do? How many comparisons? Seven million comparisons. Imagine that all these seven million numbers were not inside the computer's array, but were sitting in the desk. And every time to make a compare, comparison, Dumbo has to go to the desk and read one number. When it does not take a few microseconds, but it takes maybe 20, 30 milliseconds to read a number from the disk. Multiply 30 milliseconds by 10 million. To search for one roll number, even the fastest computer could take very long time. Clearly, this searching strategy is not good enough. Now, 
if the marks which are given to you and the roll numbers which are given to you as in this example if the roll numbers are arranged in this order all 1 million roll numbers are arranged in this order does it not give you an idea that i can consider the first roll number to be low roll number the last roll number to be high roll number and the given roll number to be somewhere between these two can i therefore not use the bisection method of finding roots applying to an entirely different problem there is no function tossing positive negative values etc but i have the gem of an idea that if i consider the first roll number to be low and the last roll number to be high the only thing that i require is that array contains roll numbers in strictly increasing order which is roughly equivalent of saying that the function crosses zero somewhere between low and high now can i not find the mid point but what is the equivalent of mid point here the mid point here will be the middle position not the middle value what is the middle position n student plus 0 by 2 or n student minus 1 plus 0 by 2 whatever low and high i find out the middle position i will check whether the middle position now not just whether it is equal to the given roll number but is it greater or is it smaller depending upon whether it is greater or smaller i now have the upper part of the array to be searched or the lower part of the array to be searched i have reduced the search space by half next iteration i reduce it by half third iteration i reduce it further by half since these are very finite numbers that we are talking of ultimately i will be looking at only one particular position if at that position the roll number does not exist the joker has not enrolled for my course but if that number exists i have found it and how many comparisons will i have to make if n is the number of students log n to the base 2 is the number of comparisons i have to make because every time i am dividing this by half 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 what is the log 10 million to the base 2 so if you have 1 crore people or 10 lakh people instead of making 1 crore or 10 lakh comparisons you can make so few comparisons this is called binary search we shall be doing this binary search implementation during this lab for which you will have a lab problem thank you so much